कुछ इसमें अच्छी बातें ये बीच में करेंगे क्योंकि ये फ्लो में बात करेंगे ना तो ये बहुत बीच में कुछ चीजें आपको दे जाएंगे जो आप अगर नोट किए हुए होंगे तो आप फिर जाके उस पर रिसर्च करेंगे हम लोगों ने क्लास कंडक्ट की थी मैंने और असन वाली ने म्यूजिक अप्रिसिएशन की उसमें से किसी ने क्लास ली थी कोई ऐसा बैठा हुआ म्यूजिक अप्रिसिएशन की क्लास उसमें एक हमने पीस लगाया था पहली क्लास के अंदर जिसका नाम था ए रॉक हां बात कर ए रिंग वो बात है वो बात कंपोजिशन जरूरी नहीं है सारा बात और जरूरत हो सकता है जो भी चीजें हो सकती हैं तो वो उस एंगल से आपने देखना है हारमोनी और काउंटर मेलोडी जो भी चीजें हैं ऐसा इस तरह से चार इंस्ट्रूमेंट देखने हैं एक एक जबरदस्त बात ये कि ये जो इसमें वो जितना आ रहे हैं ना जो नई चीज वो आपको देखने हैं स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम आपको साइज से लग रहा होगा दैट दैट इज बेस ये वो बट अभी आप हमें सुप्रानो ठीक है और ये इसके ऊपर क्लासिकल म्यूजिक डिस्प्ले करते हैं ये क्लासिकल म्यूजिक को जाते हैं वेस्टर्न क्लासिकल म्यूजिक को जाते हैं ठीक है और सारे कंपोज कर जाते हैं खुली आंख के साथ खुली दिमाग के साथ कोई अच्छा सवाल आए तो जरूर पूछिएगा घबराइएगा नहीं सवाल पूछने में इसलिए ये इसीलिए है कि आप ज्यादा से ज्यादा इनके एक्सपीरियंस से सीखिए और जिसको इंग्लिश बोला नहीं आ रहा जज के नहीं
with Jude and Ilri for like five or six, six, years. six years together. Uh, in the beginning, we were playing with two other guys, but as you can imagine, when you're working so close with each other, there are also a lot of problems. And during the years, these two guys decided to do something else. So we had to look for two other guys in the office like this. We are very happy. And um, yeah, when there's no COVID, we are playing a lot of concerts all over the world. We've been to China, to Russia, Algeria, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, USA. Just yeah. coming from the US. Yeah. yeah. So, and of course, most of the concerts we are having in, in Germany and in Europe. And when we are not playing concerts, we are like rehearsing every day. I think, yeah, five days of, of the week we are rehearsing, like uh, four hours each day together. And then, of course, everybody has to practice and rehearse by doing it herself. So it's really uh, a full time job. We will gonna go also on with the history of the instrument, but maybe first, um, one piece by. Uh, a very famous composer, at least for Western classical music, and you might have heard him, uh, is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart from Austria. He was from Austria. Um, so he composed a little piece, it's called Divertimento, it's literally a, a fun piece, and uh, it was originally for string quartet. And learn later that our instrument is not as old as, um, as many other instruments. So Mozart died before the saxophone was invented. So we're just taking music which is written for other instrumentations and make it all.
also like sax horns, like some kind of uh, trumpet and trombones. Um, so a marching band with my instrument sounds just much better than the traditional one. And the emperor agreed on a deal and he made a little competition on the Mars field of Paris, it's a big field. Um, the traditional band against the sax band and the inhabitants of Paris could decide themselves by applause which band they like best. And indeed, the sax band won. So this was a huge economical success because whole France had to be supplied freshly with these instruments. So big success here, but um, he made a mistake, a big mistake. Um, he registered the copyright for the instrument much too late. So in the meantime, there were many people just copying his invention and he went uh, bankrupt with his company like several times during his lifetime. And he basically never recovered from that. So I think also on that point, I'm not sure if history would be like this, if we would know the instrument today. But uh, his dream that the saxophone like is on all over the world on the classical stages became somehow true because these marching bands, they came also to the USA and in the United States around the same uh, around the turn of the century, so 1900 something, there was a new musical style developed, which we call jazz. And these jazz musicians, they were really happy that if they not, heard, um, if they already had invented like a new musical language, that they had now also the perfect fitting new voice for it. And that's basically the short story of how the saxophone became super super famous and the most famous jazz instrument. Um, uh, later on, it uh, could be celebrated also by classical composers, and these classical composers and these classical com uh, composers they uh, were really happy about this new color, which was very often, not always, but had always this connection with jazz. And jazz was the symbol of of Western music of the of USA. Some are also of freedom because in our tradition, in the traditional classical music, there is no improvisation. So everything is exactly written down and is supposed to play how the composer wanted it uh, to sound. And so there is no improvisation. So it stood somehow the saxophone for freedom from, from modernism. And many got attracted by that. Um, for example, also a composer with the name uh, Dmitry Shostakovich. He was a Russian composer, and um, it was a bit difficult with him because he was very interested in, in the modern in modern music, but uh, he was also a patriot. And as such patriot, he was chosen by the regime, by the Russian regime, as the composer of the country, like the main composer, you could say. And um, that brought with it that he had to compose for the regime, like marches for the military bands and so on. He loved Russian music, but he also wanted to um, like compose in a contemporary style. But he had the problem that he could not always, so the regime didn't want him to. In the beginning of his career though, he had the possibility still, and he composed, for example, this um, piece which we're gonna play now. It's called uh, Jazz Suite Number no. 1. He didn't choose the name himself, it was named by the publisher. It's not really jazz, but he mixes like elements, old elements like the waltz, which is a, a dance form, um, with some strange combination of instruments. In the original, they are really strange instruments like a Hawaii guitar or a banjo. Of course, you won't hear that today, but you will hear a bit of a strange connotation. So jazz suite number one by Dimitri Shostakovich. Thank you. Thank you. 
has a very difficult history um, in many countries, also in uh, Germany. Now we, I have the story of Russia, where he, like Charles Kovic, could not always compose like he wanted. And as we are, uh, go ahead in music history, now we were like in the 
30, I guess, yes, maybe 30, this beat was composed, and we go like some, some 20 years on, and some 10 years on, and we come to a composer, he's called Erwin Schulhoff, and uh, Schulhoff was, I guess he was Jewish, right? He was Jewish and a communist, and also very interested in modern music, in jazz, and that's why he had many problems by the German regime, and he, uh, he was arrested, put in like a concentration camp, and finally died there also. Um, Schulhoff was uh, the first one to combine different styles. He, used, he was a classical musician, but he loved dance music, he loved to go to the club, and got get inspired there, and he loved jazz music. And he took basically the same dance as you have now, like the waltz, and put in a totally different musical language. Um, so you will have here now a few dances by him. Erwin um, Schulhoff, five pieces by string.
सवाल सवाल जो आप कुछ प्लीज रिटायर So as you all know that these are uh, students that use bread, right? And so was it difficult for you to uh, transcribe classical pieces that were you know, not invented for this kind of instrument? Well, not really. Um, so um, often the musical phrase is shaped anyway um, very melodic, like you would sing it. So there are enough places where you can just take a breath. It's most of the time very natural to take a breath at one time. So as we said, we had a lot of uh, lessons with string quartets, and they were actually some are also learning from us. That's what they, at least what they said. Because as a string instrument, you can just go on and make a phrase like endless, but it feels for the audience sometimes also like oh, they they are not like shaping the phrase like up and down, which you would like with breathing. So this comes somehow natural, but of course there are also genuine string uh, pieces like this one where you need to trick a bit, but there are also like techniques where, like permanent breathing, which are uh, used in, in many, many <coughs> music where you just can go on blowing forever, basically. So, I mean, it takes some technique, but it's, it's fine, you know, it's particular problems with it. Um, but as you mentioned uh, about the instruments, I thought I forgot uh, to tell you a bit about the instruments. When Adolf Sachs invented the saxophone, he was annoyed by the, uh, by the lower pitch instruments, as Ricardo told you. And that's why the first instrument he invented was actually the bass saxophone. It's bigger even than this one. We didn't bring it today. And it's also not very common anymore. Um, I think I never played it, but um, I mean, I saw it, but we don't really use it. And then he invented a whole family of instruments. Um, this one, the, uh, these are like the four most common ones. That's the baritone saxophone. It's the biggest, therefore also the uh, lowest sounding. And uh, then you have the tenor saxophone, the alto saxophone, and that's a soprano saxophone. Many people mistake it with other instruments because it has not the typical saxophone shape. It, it's missing the bow, although there are versions with this bending. Um, but it's not basically not needed, it's just for ergonomical reasons that you uh, bend it because otherwise of course the horn would be much too long and difficult to hold. For me it's not necessary. And also many people think that the saxophone is a brass instrument. First of all, of course it's a wood, uh, it's a wood instrument um, and they think it's a brass instrument because like 99% of the instrument is made of, uh, out of brass uh, in fact. But the way you shape the tone, the way you produce the tone is with a mouse mouthpiece and it's very similar to a clarinet mouthpiece, Physic physically speaking it's the same. And uh, on this mouthpiece you have a little so-called reed, it's a little piece of wood and you put it on the mouthpiece and that's how you already can produce a sound. It doesn't sound very cool, but you can produce a sound. And that's why it's actually a woodwind instrument and not a brass instrument like trombone or trumpet. So it belongs to the same family like clarinet or bassoon. Um, and yeah, of course it's like the, how it works is with, like with every other woodwind instrument, which is uh, like different fingerings. And the longer you make the tube, so when I don't press any key, you know, the air admits already earlier, so it's a higher pitch note. And the longer I make the tube, the, the lower it sounds. That's a basic concept. Um, but it's also very different to the clarinet. The clarinet is shaped like a um, cylinder, yes. So it's basically straight and the same size of, of the thing like throughout. But here on the saxophone you have a very small here and it gets bigger here. It's similar to an oboe, for example. Also physically it works like an oboe. Um, any questions? Okay, maybe, maybe also later. Why we started saxophone? What was the motivation? What the motivation to? You know, what inspired? You? Yeah. Um, well, for me, it's very unromantic because I had two brothers. I have two brothers, and in my family, it was very common. My parents wanted that their sons are playing instruments, like two instruments. We had all two instruments, 
and we learned all the piano, yes. and then we had to choose another instrument. So she could choose, or it was chosen for us. So my eldest brother was taking up the percussion. He's also a percussionist now. My second brother was uh, uh, taking the guitar, and my, my father's dream always was to play saxophone. So I was his last chance that somebody in the family <laughs> plays the saxophone. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically had to. Uh, I, I started. Uh, I, I started with uh, piano also, like Klaus also, and um, my father is a musician and he's playing trombone. So it was somehow clear that I also will um, learn a wind instrument. And then uh, I think I was like 12 years old. I played together with a friend of school. He was playing saxophone and I was playing piano, and we played like a duo sonata. And that was the first time I, I heard the beautiful sound of the saxophone and I immediately fell in love with the instrument. And a few months later, I also started it. Did he start playing piano later? Sorry? Did he start playing piano No, no. <laughs> no. Good question, no. For me, it's also a little bit unromantic because actually I wanted, uh, it, was, it was not, uh, not my plan to become a musician. I do also do not have any musicians in my family, and um, actually I wanted to pursue the career of sport, and uh, I was basketball player, I mean, you know, like a child, I was playing basketball, and this was my only goal, I just wanted to make a career in, with sports, but then, uh, when I was around 10, 9 years old, um, then my mother brought me to the and um, there was an uh, like instrument exposition from the tent of our city and she actually al always wanted to play uh, an instrument but she didn't have the opportunity to do it so she said like why don't you just pick one instrument up try it for one month and then if you like it you go on otherwise you just leave it there is no pressure you know for this and uh, at this exhibition then she just said so uh, look the instruments which one do you like the most and actually, I was so much not interested that I just went for the color because it looks like gold and it's shiny and everything. So this was the only reason why I just said. <laughs> from that moment, I never left it. So I actually wanted to play a guitar because my older brother, who is like eight years older than me, played a guitar. And for me, he was always like, wow, you know, he's producing all these sounds. And I wanted exactly this, but I come from a city which is very small, so the music school couldn't teach me guitar. And so my brother was like, you know, you should play a saxophone because it's cool. So basically that's why I play the saxophone. Because it's cool. <laughs> but if the media asks, we tell a much more romantic story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a very specific, very specific question. Okay. Yeah. This is for these guys, basically. Sure. You guys have studied music for how long? Four years? Uh, no, no, no. We started music very long. As started I mean, or started? Started. Started. So started music. For when how long you guys were in music school? Um, Normally. In music school, we I started already as a child, and then. No, the professional music. The school, university. Like the university. Okay. When we were eighteen. Well, we, we were like really long at university, yes. like eight years. Eight years you were in the music school. Okay. Yes. But the education is based on like primary music school and then like middle music school or conservatory, there are schools that are specifically okay. just for music and then you can start. That is a model in the university, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, the social right. right, and when you're like 18, you can, like a normal university, you go to so a music, music special ah. university yeah. and then you have like, a, most of the time you have like four years, ma uh, like, sorry, it's called bachelor and that's your first degree. You can also stop there. And then you can make a master degree, which takes another two years, which we also did. And but this is just for studying the instrument, and then we added two other years of studying together. Then you have like really also lessons together. It's then not so much more about the, the instrument technique, but more about the music. There's a very specific reason I'm asking this question in the next one. Is when you guys are traveling all over the world, you guys are working as a professional musician now. How long does it take? You know. It's a very specific question for these guys because these guys are studying music and they need to know this. You know, passion is okay, passion is all right, but the practice hours, how important it is to practice and how much practice? Well, 
it takes a lot of effort, so I can tell you, a lot of effort. Um, I always say, like, there are people, it's like in sports, you know, there are people who are just have a natural talent. It is existing somehow, but in the end, this doesn't take you anywhere. So, in the end, also the most talented guys, they have just to practice, like, really every day. So, in the practice, in the end, there is the difference. And we started um, very early when we were, like, six years old or a little bit later, so between six and ten years old, we started the instrument and already there at, uh, I don't want to say like every day for hours, but pretty consistent. And I, then when I was like 12, I, I had, I practiced like several hours a day, I would say, piano and uh, saxophone. And at the university, then it gets really hard. You have to practice, I don't know, three to six hours a day. And as a quartet, we did the same when we studied. Five hours every day. Yeah, just just together. Later yeah. on, when we had the quartet, exactly, we did like five days a week, five hours. Um, it got a bit intense, so we, we reduced it. Also, when you have more concerts, you cannot keep up the schedule. But also now we are basically five meeting five days a week, mostly Monday to Friday, in the morning from nine to one, and that's so the basic rule where we uh, practice together, but then you have to, you know, you cannot just meet and, and pick up the music and read it, because most of the time it's very difficult. And so you have to prepare for every time you meet together, which means also basically every day. And yeah, and then, yeah, that's it. And this is a tough schedule. But it's like, yeah, the moment it becomes professional, it's like an important that they practice. Also, when we are on tour now, we don't have always the possibility to, um, yeah, we are in hotel room, so we cannot like play all day, um, and you feel it. Right? Of course, it's, it's quite a tough, tough thing to do. Yeah. What is your question about the grammar? Hi, my name, my question is. Uh, my, sorry, my name is Amit. Uh, my question is that when you guys are touring, like, uh, do you guys get a chance to play with other instruments? Other people who are playing with other instruments, like drums and bass. And are you guys open for that? <laughs> yeah, of course we are open for that. But um, I must admit, like this is the main uh, formation we are playing. I would say this is up to like ninety percent or ninety-five percent. Stay like this, and then we have special projects with other instruments. So we had in the past projects with a piano duo. So it's like piano four hands. So two people on one piano. We had like yeah drums. We even played with harp. That was a bit crazy. Wow. But um, we had not only had like cello, uh, violin. Um, we do all that sort of stuff, and we are very open to it. Um, what you have to know the, the the classical music tradition in in Western style is very elite, and it's very strict in what it's doing, and we try to open it a bit by mixing also styles. As I said, I, I think it's a very pity because in the very early stages of classical music in Western um, music, there was improvisation. And it's just, it was a development that they cut out the improvisation. It's a pity because I cannot really improvise. Um, I would love to. And it became also very strict in the interpretation that you cannot put your own style in it. But you also find that like a, a pity. Jazz music it just works very different, and we try to see what other people are doing, and try to get inspired by it. And it's uh, on a very basic level, but we, we, we love to get to know. We love to get to know how Pakistan music or Indian music works. It's it's beautiful for our ears. I love. It's very complex for our ears, and I find it fascinating. I just some days ago I was just like watching a lot of. Uh, YouTube videos about the how is it this rhythm structure called like colors? Uh, right. uh, yeah. Um, it, for me, it's very fascinating. All <laughs> have you ever experimented with anything? No, not yet, but maybe we will. We have one um, big project where we take music by Johann Sebastian Bach. He composed 48 fugues. It's a special style of composing, very strict. And he always put a prelude, so like an interesting piece before every prelude. So there are also 48 effort before every fugue, so there are 48 prelude. So we play the fugues and we ask 48 composers to compose a new prelude. And we want actually that these preludes are not 
written by Western European guys, but we look all around. We have the rule that it has to be every uh, every part of the world has to be represented. So there will be for sure some money from here or from India or whatever. Um, it's very interesting because every little value which comes out is like some very different. So it's very interesting to dive into the, into the heads of other musicians and see how they experience music. Tell us something about your rhythmic structure. The how rhythm? do you see rhythms? Ah, the rhythm? Yeah, how do you plan rhythms or... Yeah. Rhythms or um, you know... <laughs> a so in Western music we have what is called <coughs> different times. And... Um, I never explained this to an audience, but let me have a go. Uh, it's basically binary and... Um, Turn Turner. Turner in English. So you have one, two, one, two, that would be a binary, and the other one is one, two, three, one, two, three, right? Pretty simple. And everything base is based on this. You have different times. We played a waltz, which is in three, for example. Then there was a polka, which is in two. That is the basic structure of Western music, of, of the rhythm. The, of the meter, of the meter, and then you, uh, you put on top um, different rhythm which can be very simple or very complex and um, for us it's not we don't make the decisions about the rhythm because the composer does it for us so there are simple pieces which are very easy to understand they were also very difficult pieces so we have uh, um, when we have for example if you remember the first tune that's a very basic melodic and also rhythmical structure it's very easy um, but we played also we didn't have it we don't have it today but there is other pieces where we get the sheet music and i cannot fucking read one one note which is written there because it's written so complex that i basically need like a calculator and i'm like okay what's what, what's that it's like mathematics and then other tunes you just pick up and can read it and these you know, very complex tunes which you are like studying for months that you actually can come from A to Z and then you have to like play with the others together and they play something really different and then you figure out how the rhythm rhythms go together so this takes also <coughs> months to figure it out and you try to come as close as possible sometimes it's so complex that it's like inhuman but um, I'm also surprised like how close you can, can come and I think it's nobody's um, will that it sounds like a computer but uh, contemporary composers love to and notate rhythm really precise uh, because other music it, it, there is this uh, kind of meter and rhythms but you can go with the flow a bit you can change the tempos in between you can stretch certain parts um, by feeling or by style and so sometimes it, it's common in a style to do some stuff and this you have to learn uh, yeah, in, in academic studies how how different styles are treated. I mean, the sheet music in the end looks always the same. We have always just these black dots, um, but you have to learn what it actually means. So in, in different times, it sometimes means something else. I would like I would like to take a snap later. Not sure, now. sure, sure. Uh, also, explain. Could you explain the notations of your instrument? How it's tuned, or what is the standard pitch, or what yeah. are the notations? So, um, it's. Uh, also very complicated, let me explain. Um, basically, I think in a scale, so we have different scales, and I, I think in a scale, for example, I think in, it's called C major. I think, but in reality, it sounds B major. It has historical reasons, it's not very logic, but it is like it is. So I, when I say for myself, I play now a C, and I ask you to play a C, it's actually two different pitches because we are transposing instruments. I'm pitched in B, it's E flat, again e, uh, B, but one of the lower, yes. and then again E B flat. E flat. Uh, sorry, E flat, yes. Um, B flat, E flat, B flat, E flat. And um, that gets also in rehearsal sometimes complicated because when we want to analyze which chord is sounding right now, we have to always add, do you mean C like I finger? the C or like it sounds, so it's <laughs> some of the communication goes a bit, gets a bit weird. So we try always to adapt the real notation, which yeah. is like on the piano, you know, like on the piano, 
Right, so we just try to think in this way. So for me, I don't know, uh, C for the piano would be a D for us. So I would not say, um, can you play this D, for example, because D for, would, wouldn't make any sense for her. So I would just say, can you play this C? Understand? So just referring to the piano notation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's easier to understand. It's, it's really a mess. I, I, I this has really <laughs> re historical reasons which nowadays make not really oh, right. much sense. But the scale degrees, what are they? Well, we have two different basic modes. It's called major and minor. So the, the most of the Western music, it works like this. And you start from different um, bass notes. So you have uh, C major, C sharp major, you're just transposing it. It's, it's like compared to Indian or Pakistan music, it's much more easy in the end. And the thing is, we change uh, the mm, in between, a like in, in a piece, we can shift the, the root note. I, as far as I understood, um, you stay in the same mode. Yeah, yeah. For quite a long time. So root fix, yeah, the root root fix, and we like it's called modulating. We modulate like all the time. And the the all the music the modulations are basic but same stuff we were discussing in theory class class. Yeah. In the last class. Yeah. So um, in in older music you can say this piece overall is in C major in one mode. In between it modulates but it generates all related to C major. So there are also different relations, very complicated to explain now. But the further you go, the, the composers then break these rules and just use pitches however. So if they don't relate anymore to a, a specific tonic or something, then it's like free toner, we call it. You can just use any note at any time. There are also other developments who said, like, this goes to, uh, no, first of all, there was a development who said, like, we don't want that there is a basic note which all the other notes circle around. And so we have the C and the others are in a connection to C. You feel when that all wants to uh, gravitate to the C. And then there were composers like Schoenberg who said, no, every note is equal. So it's like a democracy, a uh, democracy in total. And then he said, like, you know, when I play a C, I have to play all the other pitches till it's allowed to be back on the C. So when you have a melody, first all, I mean, I mean, our system is divided into 12 different notes. So you have to play all the notes before you can ba come back to the C. It's very unnatural, but very interesting. Also very complex to compose like this. And yeah, then there are like counter developments who said like this gets too unnatural, too complex to, to listen. So they come back to very easy harmonies and, and, and melodic structures. And nowadays you have just everything. Like the, the styles of today, you cannot basically say it's a, it, this is the style because it, it's like a postmodern era where you can do basically whatever you want. You can compose like 100 years ago, that's fine. Or you can just invent all your your own thing in the end. So yeah, to sum up several hundred years of <laughs> development <laughs> like this. I don't know if it's really correct, but yeah. Um, the most common scale would be C major. Yeah, and, and the, 
the main difference is that you guys like uh, more like developing in a in a melodic way, and we we are based more in harmonies, which we like relate to each other. That's like a main different concept. So if you have jazz music, it's it's all about harmony, and it gets very complex. And harmonies like the notes you shift on top of each other. That's the color in the end. Less the melodic development. Also, it's also Can we adjust this instrument with all of the instruments out there? Because there is a song called Havana by Kamela Kambelo, where the major instrument was this saxophone. And there were many more instruments as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So what so is the question? So can we adjust it all of the all, music music all of the instruments out there? Uh, well, you know, you have, um, when we take up an, a string, an original string quartet composition, it's very easy because it's already just four voices, so we can just transpose it in the end, and most of the time it works. Um, and then you have other music where you just have a lot of different instruments, or you have a whole orchestra where a lot of melodic lines and a lot of harmonies, rich harmonies, happen at the same time. And then you have to see what you do. You can um, like trick a bit, uh, make like uh, yeah acoustic tricks in, in the arrangement, or you just basically simplify it to the uh, main stuff. That's that's um, it's an art form itself arrangement. Uh, so that you have we have like one. You can play it maybe. Let's play like uh, America. Uh, it's also from a musical from Bernstein West Side Story. And uh, the original is for a whole orchestra, like the hundreds of instruments, but you can reduce the main musical message to four voices because there's, the, uh, you can say that the original idea of our music are like triads. Triads, and you can add other, so three notes uh, at the same time, and you can add, add other notes to make it more colorful. But the basic concept always stays the same. So if you, uh, bit tricky you can reduce not everything but most of the stuff to four voices. So let us maybe the last question and then we can play America. Is there a last question? Uh, how you guys compose all the sound? I just want to know the procedure of you guys, how you compose. Yeah then uh, and, and most mostly we have the lyrics too. But this may uh, the lyrics makes us to compose a song you don't have lyrics so how what makes you compose a song? So First of all, you have to understand um, that, um, that we are in the role of the interpret, so the interpretation. We basically don't compose our own music. We play by other composers. What we do is more called like arranging, so transcribe it from music, music which exists, so tunes that exist for us. So this, the role of the composer and the interpret is very like, separated. It is like this. It's, it's a pity. But um, we basically don't compose our own music. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No um, so we play one one last short tune, yeah. <laughs>